Hey out there, this is Friday, February 8th, 2019, and it is just about uh, exactly uh, 8.35 in the morning here in Northern California. Today, as usual, I'll get into a lot of different stuff, but, um, you know, I kind of wanted the theme to be just um, reinforcing this idea that uh, we not only can be, but should be every human being's friend. And as much of a pipe dream as we have been trained to believe that is, I would like to discuss the possibility that it really is possible that humanity as a whole, race, a species, can live together in peace and harmony, safety, security, freedom and prosperity, universally speaking that we can indeed all be free. And a lot of what I've learned in life is based on the teachings of Christ. But the teachings of Christ are also something that human beings contain intuitively, instinctively. Because as you learn, if, if you ever decide to learn scripture and you know go to church maybe and listen to preaching and read for yourself and have Bible studies or whatever, you'll find out some controversial information. And among that information you're going to find out is <clears throat> this idea that uh, that unless we call on the name of Jesus, we can't be saved. That that is our only hope. And a lot of people just cringe at that and and they should, and a lot of Christians should too, because the fact is, is that plenty of people have lived and died, okay, and they never heard the name of Jesus, but they intuitively, instinctively have the same Christ-like qualities. We all have them. So when you understand as a starting point, you know, for building on that instinct, that instinct to be Christ-like that we all have, that was given to us by our maker, our owner, the creator God. Okay, first establishing that you believe in God because I don't know how I can get across to somebody that is atheistic, you know, that rejects the idea that there's creation. To me, that is on its face illogical not to believe there's a designer, a creator. There's just far too much mystery involved here, okay, for there not to be somebody in charge of this thing, okay? The same way none of our technology came to be on its own. It didn't evolve. It, a rock didn't suddenly put out a laptop computer, okay? Design went into it. We used our brain. Many people used their brains collectively and put it together and said, hey, you know, they built on each other's ideas. Ideas are abstract, they're invisible. The thought, imagination, all these things are invisible, but they're very powerful. I mean, how does an atheist explain that? This is a magnificent, mysterious, fantastical quality that we've been endowed with. I mean, what else could it be? Why would the brain evolve from a rock or, or, or anything else? Okay, it doesn't make any sense. It, there's thought behind it. Just like there's thought behind building a new automobile. Plenty of it. Okay. So when you understand that intuitively we, we have this. So I would disagree with taking the idea that, you know, this is the only name by which we can be saved on face value. Okay. I would say, well, let, let's discuss this. And then you, you realize, hey, a lot of people have lived and died their whole lives never heard the name of Jesus, but they're going to heaven. And the reason that they're going to heaven is because their hearts are pure and clean. They're righteous. They have integrity and honor. Okay, they value things like their reputation. Their values, although intuitive and instinctive, are in line. They're in sync. They're on the same page with their designer, their owner, the creator, God Almighty. So, by valuing conscience, for example, okay, this pays great dividends in the realm of eternity. 
You see, this earth, this world, this realm we live in now is temporal. We all know that. That's science. It's fleeting. Here today, gone tomorrow. Not to be morbid, but we all know that's the way it is. It's just not conjecture. None of us know when our last day on earth is. So it's a very insecure, it's a very tenuous existence we have here. You see, we're, we're supposed to know and tap into our intuitive understanding that we want to live forever. This thing we call death is indeed a bad thing. If we had a consensus of all the people that are enjoying their lives and their existence as human beings, we would find indeed they love life and they hate death. They don't want to die. I mean, that's the whole idea. And this is the whole idea behind understanding what the Bible is all about and understanding what this great gift that was given us, this understanding of God, that it can't be kept secret. If it was kept secret, none of us could do what fundamentally this God wants us to do, which is to please him and to emulate him, to be like him, to understand him more and emulate his character, his nature, his personality, hers. Because, of course, the first chapter in the Bible establishes that God is male and female. This is the nature of God. This is what God chooses to be. Just like he created us as an image and likeness, male and female. It's all very wondrous and magnificent. And the good news comes from God not having given up on us. Because this original sin, this fall of man, the knowledge of good and evil, and the subsequent curse that befell the earth okay caused God to be very very sorrowful to the, the point where he it says he repented of having created us so you understand <coughs> we're very lucky you could say blessed okay but fortunate to have a God like the one that we have that he didn't give up on us but he put a plan into motion that took these thousands of years to run its course to play itself out because of his great mercy and he's knowing how corrupted that the human nature was now and how hard it was going to, to reach us from now on. I mean, our ears are stopped up. Our eyes are, they're covered over. I mean, we're, we're in, in a trance, a satanic trance is what's happened. It's affected our DNA, this thing called death through this lie that we believe we were deceived. We bought into it. We ate the fruit, the knowledge of good and evil. And then we knew that we could rebel against God. We could go against him. We could sin. And we could, we could reap the harvest of the, the pain that it causes us, the sense of separation from God. So God knew this was a horrendous thing. And it's gonna, it just took, I mean, God knows best that it's going to take these thousands of years to play itself out. And if you read the prophets of old from the beginning to the end, if you read through and you see the grand plan and scheme here and how Jesus, this idea of at some point in history, he was going to come to the earth just like as it was written, okay, through Mother Mary, uh, you know, this immaculate conception, okay, where Jesus didn't have a biological natural dad. His dad was the almighty creator God. And to me, that's not far out. I mean, what's far out? Good God, you live in a freaking... A universe, I mean, talk about far out. Everything's far out. You're far out. I'm far out. We're all far out, man. This is far out. This existence is cosmic. We're part of something big here. And the whole idea is that it goes on forever. And God wants us to be a part of it. God is like our beloved parents. Our parents that love us in a, in a way that we, we could spend all our lives trying to understand. But we won't fully understand because this is about eternity. We're a part of, the, he just wants us to be children and play and enjoy our lives and be appreciative and, you know, eat, drink and be merry and frolic and, and live together in peace and harmony and safety and security and contentment and joy and, and euphoria and bliss and, and freedom and prosperity. I mean, it, only what's logical and reasonable to assume and knowledge will reach a critical mass. We're going to find our way back. God is, that's why it's taken these thousands of years, okay, because we've been largely unteachable. The power of Satan in this world is, it can't be over, overstated, okay? It, it's through the money. This is how Satan's been operating, okay? It's the money, I'm telling you. I mean, just Jesus said it too. He spelled it out. I mean, you can have a sense of it. That's why endemic people, native people in South America, they don't want anything to do with the Western ways and the money and all this crap. 
They know. I mean, any other creature on earth that they could understand the, the misery it's wrought upon us, the humanity, for thousands of years now, they wouldn't want anything to do with it. And, and human beings at the, at the top of the food, the intellectual food chain, okay, and we just fall head over heels. I mean, God knows we're, we're, like, we're, we're like demons, all of us, like brute beasts, imbeciles, pathetic, pitiable, wretched, miserable creatures because we've bought into this hook, line, and sinker. I mean, it's horrible. I mean, in the churches even, it, it, it just, the power, it, 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 it's, it's horrendous, okay? It is, it is, I mean, I don't know how to describe the power of money, the power of the beast in this world, okay? But this has to go. This whole paradigm has to be shattered, and God is the only one that can shatter it. And it's got to start in my life, in your life, in our lives as individuals and understand, hey, this is not tenable. We, we've got to, at some point in human history and evolution, we've got to get off the junk, okay, completely. This money love, okay. Jesus said the love of money is a root of not some of the evil, but all of the evil. Somehow it's all connected. This is Satan's power, his ambrosia, and he's very skillful at getting us to believe that should be ours too. And this makes common sense. This is pragmatic and practical. You see, we're trained everywhere we look. It's all about money. Duh. Of course. You know, I mean, I talk, I'm, I'm hard on the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. So what? Grow some skin, for God's sake. Okay, we're all Americans. We all want truth and, you know, justice, the American way and all that fairness, right? I mean, I hate crony capitalism straight up. And I don't support anybody that supports crony capitalism. I mean, I like townships and the people that live in townships. They don't want to be incorporated. They don't want to be a city. They don't want you pushing industry on them. They like their nice little slow lifestyle, okay? You move to any unincorporated township in California, it's far more livable. If you can get yourself established there, okay, it's far more livable than most of the cities because what happens is it always raises the cost of living, the burden, the tax on the citizens. So, I mean, that's what it's about. And to support crony capitalism is to support all this, all this uh, sympathy and all the people that, that have faith in, believe in socialism. And what is socialism? Isn't it basically a branch of communism? So you see the correlation why I, you know, make fun of the Chamber of Commerce and call them the Chamber of Communists. Okay, because I'm not picking on any individuals. I understand. I had my four-year real estate license. I, I know the score. I know what it's all about. Money, money, money. Business is always good. The more the merrier. Put demand on stuff and prices go up. Boom. Yes, create booms and, and all. Right. <coughs> so... Look, I'm, I don't judge anybody to the point of condemnation, okay? Otherwise, I, I understand Scripture, too. Okay, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And it's written that with the measure of judgment you use toward others, that same measure shall be used toward you. And that seems fair. God is a fair God. Everything makes sense in the realm of God. But anyhow, I digress because I wanted to finish up the point I was trying to make is that God didn't give up on us. So for thousands of years, he, this plan was in place. He was going to give us the Savior called Jesus, the Messiah. See, it, Christ became like a surname, but really we know that it means Messiah. So properly said, it would be Messiah Jesus or, uh, you know, Jesus the Messiah, okay, the Christ. So anyhow... <clears throat> Um, you understand that, I, you know, I don't want anybody thinking I'm anti-business because um, I'm an entrepreneur. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to launch a business. I'm trying to get a tool manufactured and, and, you know, it's a big deal. And, you know, what I, I don't like about it is it involves money. And, uh, you know, I, the way I feel is that I've got something to contribute. I mean, I know every landscaper on earth would want this as one of his most fundamental tools that he'd carry and would never be without this tool that I have, okay, to offer, okay? And that to me is a contribution to humanity, to society. I mean, that's a beautiful thing, but it needs to be available in the hardware stores. It's got to be something they can pick up and handle. And say, This is what I was looking for, okay? 
It can't be something online. That's not going to work. So it's a big deal in terms of finding marketers and distributors and, of course, money. You understand? Everything's involved. Money, payoffs, and all this. Everybody wants a kickback. Everybody, you got all these middlemen. Hey, you want a connection here or there? I, I know the contacts, and I know how it works. So money is involved in doing those things. And then there's no way you can afford to manufacture something like this in, in the United States. It's got to be forged. So the only forger I've got, metal forging, is in 